uh, going online today and joining our fifth webinar session with our international university partners featuring University Technology Mara from Malaysia. And I would like to introduce to you for our moderator for today, uh, Mr. Taufan Tegu Akbari, Vice Rector 3 of LSPR Communication and Business Institute. Um, Mr. Taufan, are you there? Hello, Hello. Mr. Taufan, are you there? Okay. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in our international relation uh, webinar uh, this time is really special uh, because we have we have uh, our professor from malaysia and before we start our presentation um uh, my pleasure for me my name is taufan taguakbari re representing lspr jakarta and uh, such an honor for me because we're going to have a very insightful discussion this afternoon so uh, hi to everyone who already joined with us this afternoon uh, i think there's some lspr students uh, some of our LSPL lecturers, also LSPL staff management, and any other friends from any from from other countries such as Malaysia. Hi, uh, from Jakarta. Uh, we really hope that you are in a good condition, and uh, we are still optimists, and we still can pass through this with a good condition as well. And uh, before that, I would like to say hi to our uh, beloved speakers from um, Malaysia, Professor Kiranjit. Uh, can you hear my voice? Professor, how are you, Professor? Yes, hi, I'm doing fine, and uh, welcome to everyone to this session. Professor Kiranjit, are you with us? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm with you. Professor? Yes, I'm speaking. Um, Ms. Kenik, maybe you yes, can help can me you. to uh, contact Prof. Kiranjit. Prof. Kiranjit, are you still with us? Are you yes, already with us? Yes, I am. If you see me, I'm with you. Can you uh, hear me? Okay. We we're hearing her Tofan. We're on. Hello, Tofan. Yes, can you hear us? Hello. Professor Kiranjit is already on. Okay. Yes, can you hear me? Okay, I have a technical problem. Sorry. Uh, can the others hear me? Yes, yes, ma'am. We can hear you. All right. Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Okay. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to International uh, Webinar Series. When this time, I'm Taufan Tegakbari, representing LSPL Jakarta. It's such an honor for me because this afternoon, we're going to have our beloved professor, Professor Kiranjit from Malaysia, that will share about the uh, latest topic about the uh, COVID-19. And I would like to say hello and hi from Jakarta and from LSPR to our friends from all around the places uh, in Jakarta, in Indonesia, and maybe uh, our friends outside of Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, hi from Jakarta. And uh, I would like to say hi also to our beloved lecturers, uh, LSPR staff, LSPR management, and our LSPR student as well that already joined with us this, uh, this afternoon. Uh, before that, I would like to say hi to our beloved professor, Prof. Kiranjit. Uh, do you hear my voice? How are you, Prof? I'm good, thank you. Can you hear me? Hi, Prof. I cannot hear your voice. Um, hi, Prof. I cannot hear I, your voice. I don't know, but I can hear you. I do not know if the others can hear me. Yes, Prof, we can hear you. So fun, we, we can hear Professor Karanjit. I think you have a problem with your um, speaker. I think I have a trouble with, with my microphones because I cannot I hear Professor.
Maybe it's a connection just between Tofan and my computer. Yeah, can you hear my voice now? I can. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Sorry, because here in Bintaro is heavy rain and uh, the internet Wi-Fi is dropped. Sorry for all the technical uh, problem. <laughs> oh, this is uh, the things that we have to face during this uh, webinar, right? Oh my God! Yes, we are on again. Uh, hope, uh, so you can hear my voice uh, previously, right? So I can just uh, pass through the, the introduction. So Prof Kiranjit, how are you? Hopefully I can Good, hear you. Oh, okay, nice. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, yes, guys. Uh, before we start our session, let me introduce you to uh, our professor, our uh, professor profile. Um, let me share my 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 screen to you. Okay. Okay. Can you see my slide, Miss Candy? Yes, we can oh, see it. Okay, thank you, Prof. All right, uh, our discussion session uh, today, we're gonna discuss about the ethical challenges in navigating misinformation in the pandemic. So uh, I would like to, to uh, stress uh, once again that the misinformation and disinformation is two different things. So the, uh, the things that we're gonna discuss today is about the misinformation during the pandemic. So today we already have uh, our distinguished speakers, Professor Dr. Kiranjit Kaur. She's a professor from the Faculty of Communication and Media Studies from University Technology Mara, Malaysia. And uh, I would like to read uh, her uh, bi short biography. Uh, Prof. Kiranjit Kaur, PhD, is an honorary professor in the public relations at the Faculty of Communication and Media Studies, University of Technology Mara, Shah Alam, Selangor, Malaysia. She has published a number of journal articles and book chapters in her research interests, areas of public relations management, media studies, and media ethics, and women in media. Prof. Kiranjit is a fellow and an accredited public relations member of the Institute of Public Relations Malaysia, or IPRM, with more than 30 years of experience in public relations education. She serves on the IPRM Council and chairs in the IPRM Education Chapter. She also sits on the Council of the Industry-Based Communication and Multimedia Content Forum, or CMCF, the Network's Media Research Collaboration Program, Steering Committee of Malaysian Communication and Multimedia Commissions. And she chairs the Media Committee of the National Council of Women Organization, NCWO Malaysia. Prof. Kiranjit graduated, graduated with a PhD in Mass Communication from the University of Maryland, USA. And if you want to contact her, you can reach her at kkluther at gmail.com. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, I got, uh, okay. Guys, uh, short about our introduction before Prof. Kiranjit presentation, I would like to share a few information that I had explained before. Uh, everyone talk about the coronavirus, the, the pandemic, and uh, how we, we, uh, we, we uh, face the information that how we navigate the information during the pandemic and um, it's important to only share the information from the trusted sources but in fact that 
a lot of misinformation going on during uh, within our phones, our our cell phones, our social media, and uh, as I mentioned before, that today we're gonna uh, discuss about the misinformation. So the differences between misinformation and disinformation. That misinformation is a false information that is spread regardless of whether there is intent to mislead. So like in chaotic hours after like this pandemic, as we know, a lot of misinformation was reported in the news on in our social media. And people are hungry uh, for the information and where's the lack of consensus oriented information when everything is being constated in the public that creates confusion among people. And now confusion is everywhere. Uh, I will share a few information from the Nielsen that uh, during the, the COVID-19, most of the people access the information through the multi news multiple times, like from TV and social media, as we see here, uh, from, uh, from the newspaper until a uh, few social media sites, chat apps, radio, uh, and any other uh, media channels. And uh, I will directly here. As the world battles the deadly COVID-19 pandemic and people are searching for clear facts and answer to questions that could help save countless lives. Even WHO partnered with TikTok. They tried to uh, arrange the message so can deliver it effectively to the young people. So uh, the uh, the selection of, of, of the media it also affect how, how the uh, media delivered in a good result. And this is like, even we actually in the Instagram, they have almost 2 million of followers discuss about the pandemic itself. So that's a short introduction from me. So maybe uh, Prof. Kiranjit can uh, start your presentation before uh, we also had a, a question and answer with the audience. Yes, Prof. This is uh, your time to present. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll wait for my slides to come on. Yeah. Nadi? Uh, yeah, Nadi, maybe you can share the slides. Okay. Okay, a very uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for inviting me to share a little bit on this topic with all of you. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I guess there are academics as well as students in today's audience. And uh, we, I'll speak for about 30 to 40 minutes and then we'll have about 20 minutes for Q&A, if that's all right with everyone. So uh, today my session will be a little bit on ethical challenges in, the navigating, in navigating misinformation in a pandemic. We use the word pandemic really to refer to COVID-19 for in today's context. Next, please. So, you know, most of us feel like this, right? I fell asleep in one world and woke up in another. I think we all felt that maybe at different points of time between December and March, but by March, I would say everyone was thinking like this. Next. So everyone, I think, has seen enough images on the social media as well as on your mainstream media to understand that the virus looks something like this. And of course, this is the earlier days when, uh, sorry, we are still on this, yeah. The earlier days when you still had deaths nearing only 50,000 and uh, there, was, there were already conspiracy theories and all kinds of false information you know, uh, misinformation being spread on all the social media to people who didn't understand the extent of the problem that we were about to face. Next. So COVID-19, this is our astro banner. I like the banner, so I used it. So what do we understand eh, about this uh, COVID, uh, the, the novel coronavirus pandemic of COVID-19? COVID-19 because it was something that was recognized in 2019. But it caused an unprecedented global disruption, bringing life as we, knew, as we know it to an abrupt halt. Today, there's an estimated 4.2 million people estimated infected 
and 282,947 deaths globally. This was as of this morning from WHO figures. It has led to global travel bans and restrictions. There's movement control within the neighborhood, shaken up the financial markets, shut down schools for several weeks. Education has gone digital in most universities. Religious congregations are banned and all our social business events, conferences have been canceled and are slowly going online. Next. So what do we know of this pandemic so far? We know there is no vaccine or treatments available currently. We know there's a lack of knowledge how the virus is behaving. We have uh, different information every day on uh, how it can hit any individual of any age. Significantly impacted businesses across all sectors and tested crisis preparedness plans and has led to enhanced cooperation and collaboration among business, government and civil society in, off in all kinds of efforts to beat the beast as well as to see to the essential needs of the frontliners and also of the society because there are so many people out there who didn't even have enough food or were not even able to get food. If you look at you know the situation in India when the lockdown came in, many were stranded and had to like walk 800 kilometers, some of them. That's a long walk. So this is what we do know of the pandemic as of today. Next. Just to look at some figures for Malaysia, I'm going to discuss a little bit more on Malaysian as well. We, this is yesterday's figures. Huh? Every evening, the new figures are released by the Director, of, Director General of Health. So this was what was released uh, as of yesterday. Um, we have a total of 109 deaths. At first, we were the highest in Malaysia with the number of deaths. But of course, now Indonesia has taken over and the Philippines. So if you look at the Indonesian numbers, it's already 624, Philippines 726. And in Southeast Asia, we come, actually we come fourth now because even, uh, sorry, we are third because Singapore has more cases, but less than. Okay, next. So everyone is a factor, everyone. The frontliners as well as everybody who is anybody, every citizen. No matter what job you hold, don't hold a job, homemaker, mothers, everybody is affected, including the drain sweepers, the garbage collectors, because they had to come out and, you know, face the virus while keeping our neighborhoods clean as well. Next. Collaboration was something that was seen suddenly to really um, increase and hard, was really enhanced. We hadn't seen such cooperation, I think, in many, 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 many decades. For many of us, probably in our first, first in our lifetime, that we are seeing such great collaboration among everybody. If you notice, all our webinars have gone free, where we would have had to pay for them. We are getting a lot of new knowledge on what to do, what not to do. And then we have everybody sitting down and uh, starting to help in uh, preparing PPEs, the protective equipment that's needed by the frontliners, as well as people donating food, ration, cooking food for people who are stuck in uh, lockdown areas. Next. So these are some of the areas like the lockdown areas I was talking about. Next. Idea next. So, so this is the food that has been delivered to the homeless people who are also abandoned, and there they are, they're coming out for their meals. Next. Volunteers sewing suits for nearby medical centers. Next. And this is happening everywhere in the world, not just in Malaysia. And in the Malaysian context, you can see almost every ministry is involved. But there's the women's ministry, the cyber security ministry, the trade uh, industry, of course, uh, security, home affairs, health, the whole lot, education. Next. So now let's get into rumors and fake news. The reason why I'm using fake news because it is a very popular word used by everybody um, who is, you know, 
the ordinary citizen, the ordinary person, a lot of students, they're not going to use the word misinformation. It's more trendy to say fake news. But UNESCO will tell you, hey, don't use the word news when it's fake because news is normally verified and checked. To them, it's, you know, journalistic kind of news when you talk about news and information from, of course, uh, authorities who are credible. But generally, let's use the word fake news for now because it's what we all understand. And we have psychology scholars as well as media scholars will say that the origin is rumors. If you really look at it, it's rumors. It's a spread, the rampant spread of rumors from many sources, social media, websites, news media, politicians, family, your neighbors, your colleagues, your children. And they come from on all platforms. They come, uh, of course, social media has made it worse. So in today's day and age, it is because of social media that rumors have gone more rampant. Previously, you did have rumors, but they couldn't be so widespread crossing boundaries, you know, uh, national boundaries, geographical boundaries. Now, because of social media, they are just going everywhere. The information, whether right or wrong, is going everywhere. So when you look at rumors, you look at, there are, you can probably divide them into four categories. Some are harmless. You know, like those we saw of blue rivers, of dolphins swimming in the canals of Venice, pollution-free blue skies in overcrowded cities, clear views of uh, Himalayas in New Delhi. In Malaysia, there was one river that was suddenly looking clean and everybody was saying, oh, it's because of the lockdown. There's no one out there to, to, to cause pollution. But the person had taken the photograph said, hey, I took that photograph before the lockdown, a month before we even went into any lockdown. The river was already been cleaned by the authorities. So it's like, just whatever feels good, feels nice. So those are harmless kind of rumors. Then you have wishful, like those indicating a vaccine has been developed in India or that drinking warm water will stop the virus from entering the lungs or drinking bleach will kill the virus. Actually, these are not necessarily wishful. These can also be dangerous as we'll talk about it later. Some are divisive, like those implicating China of deliberately manufacturing the virus in a lab as a biological weapon or US bringing the virus in Wuhan, or Bill Gates manufacturing the virus, or 5G causing the virus. Now this causes divisiveness because it can cause uh, political uh, you know, instability amongst nations. And some have caused fear, like those accusing migrant workers and illegal migrants, foreigners, who are living in cramped quarters or being heavily infected and will spread the virus to all, or like the cell phones aggravating the virus, like we mentioned. So you can be, they can be harmless, they can be wishful, they can be divisive, and they can be harmful. All right, next. They can be fearful. So this was something that was nice. The, the ones that are really just harmless kind of rumors. Elephants passing out, drinking corn wine in Chinese villages. Of course, it was debunked. Dolphins in the canals of Venice. Again, all these were debunked. Next. And you have United the, the WHO as well as UNESCO coming up with all kinds of information to counter or to debunk stories that are going on out there among citizens and uh, I should say netizens as well. Netizens who are carrying information that can be giving the wrong information and that can actually harm an individual. So if you rinse your nose with saline, will it help prevent infection with the new coronavirus? No. Can eating garlic help prevent infection? No. Can it affect younger people? Yes, it's not just for the young, older people as we have found in many countries overseas, internationally. So the thing is to look at science versus fiction. Yeah? In, in these kinds of situations. Next. This is the photograph of uh, our prime minister. So this is like a harmless thing, but it was wrong information given and uh, people used slides of 
when you know you say that there's going to be a special speech by him so everybody gets worried because is it going to be another lockdown or a stricter like lockdown or whatever but this one you know they started using the same poster and they started mirroring it and putting it with wrong information wrong dates so like people get ready to go to the media to the to mainstream media to watch the pm speech when actually there was none and then of course you had the official sources debunking and saying this is uh, brita palsu so these were things that have happened during this pandemic and are happening during this pandemic next another one where somebody when you know we have malaysians who are very very creative they get all kinds of information and then they add their own and make it look very nice like a nice infographic and put in things and then of course they want to attribute it to somebody who is credible so they attributed something to the director general of health who comes out every day to give the updates on uh, what is going on during this period of the pandemic but there were things in here that he did not say like he didn't say you don't go to the cinema uh, of the mall anyway at this time the cinemas and malls were shut down they were not even open so why would he even say that and even the barber shops were closed so th there are things that you know are put out which therefore mislead people because they're talking about things here that actually were not even available for people to go to so again it had to be countered with a false the same poster and put the word that palsu and uh, fake so that everyone can it is actually the authorities using the netizens to also viral what is false to the others and if they have sent something saying that this was true now they're sending it to say it's false it's the way they were handling it they were managing it okay next again another one when the first day when uh, shops were allowed to be opened more shops were allowed to be opened so there were photographs showing oh my god why did we open up suddenly when there are so many people crowding the virus will again come back in another way and the shop owner who recognized the shop said that hey these are all the workers we are testing them taking their temperature getting them to register before we allow them to go into the mall to open their shops so it's not the customers and but even the shopkeepers shopkeepers had to be you know keep 1 meter apart kind of thing so that kind of fear that leads gives to the people you know it, it sort of causes fear to the people are we going to see another wave next so all these are spread through the social media this was another one a japanese professor is well known for his health uh, comments and how he was again wrongly attributed and said that the virus was man made when he never did so you know individuals passing misinformation to cause further fear to misinform next so that's me and you trying not to get infected by the media virus so you know where we put our mask and of course you had donald trump talking about uh, this of course later he said it was a joke but of any everybody and anybody started riding on whatever he had said now political figures came out to make remarks that were not scientific and not medically proven and this unfortunately also led to a lot of misinformation So he's saying about using Lysol and Clorosol, Clorox and Dettol as a way to get rid of your of the virus, and of course we all know from, from from you know by now we all know it was all satire. It was never meant to be true, but it was the wrong thing for a political leader to have said, and it caused another wave of fear. Next, so let's look at the definitions. Huh? and these are definitions given by unesco as well as others so we have rumors often when we talk about fake news we are talking about rumors we are talking about misinformation disinformation malinformation rumors stories that circulate widely without trustworthy verification okay so the falsification 
misinformation, stories that are true, sorry, uh, stories that are untrue, information that is false but not created with the intention of causing harm. This information is information that is false and deliberately created to harm a person, social group, organization, or country. Now, often we tend to think fake information, fake news, or with politics, we always say that politicians use fake news for their own agenda. So we start looking at agenda setting kind of theories to discuss fake news. Now, the agenda setting theories and the political mileage that is got from passing false information, we often call that disinformation because really sometimes it is half truths and it is uh, uh, it's actually wrong information to harm the other party and to get votes for yourself. And that is not something we are going to be discussing today. Malinformation, information that is based on reality used to inflict harm on a person, social group, organization, or country. When you understand a little bit and you begin to attribute it to a bigger picture, so sometimes you view it in a, in, in a different way. You know there is some truth in it, but it's not the full truth. So that's malinformation. So just to recap it, both misinformation and disinformation can fuel the rumor chain. So when someone shares a story they've heard not knowing with certainty if it is true or false, they're said to be spreading a rumor. And uh, this is what often is uh, labeled as fake news by a lot of people on the street. Next. So according to a Pew poll done earlier in uh, April, the percent of Americans who have heard false information about COVID-19 was 48%. 48% said they'd heard it. And many believed it. 23% believed that the virus was purposefully manufactured in a laboratory by China. Just to show that, you know, misinformation, false information can influence a lot of your perceptions and your understandings or understanding of something and your beliefs about a situation. And in a pandemic, when everything is unclear, uncertain, and you're full of uh, fear yourself, this becomes very damaging. Next. Heidi, yeah. So misinformation perseveres. I'm sure by now most of you know about the pandemic. The pandemic was a video that was spread widely on social media on, uh, since May 4th. And it was, uh, it looked like a professional news interview, but in reality, it was peddling very uh, long debunked falsehoods about the coronavirus. In this professionally produced video, the discredited scientist, even the scientist was a discredited scientist, falsely claimed that masks can make virus sick, the sand from the beach can build up coronavirus immunity, and that uh, vaccines for the virus are dangerous when there's no, vi even there's no vi vaccine available. And at that point of time, when this was all being viral in the U.S., already 70, 75,000 people in the U.S. were dead. Today, of course, more than a quarter million, are, you know, uh, there's already, sorry, more than 100,000 already dead now. So at that time, it was 75,000. So Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo all said that they were taking the video down. So even the social, big social media platforms had to come in and do their own governance. Ethically, they had, they were either asked by the government or so on their own accord here, they started taking down the videos. But you know, it's so difficult because individuals have, have the video already downloaded and will keep viraling it. And of course, we forget about other platforms like WhatsApp, which is what most of us are using. So it's quite difficult to curtail, even though the big guns like Facebook, uh, Facebook YouTube, Vimeo and the rest do try their best at this time to try to take down whatever is seen to be not true. Next. Just a little bit about Malaysia, just to put you in the context, why this is such a big issue in Malaysia, like I'm sure it's also in Indonesia and many parts of the world. Social media penetration. Malaysia is in the top five globally. 79% of the population use internet. At the same time, 75% are active social media users. And average use is about five hours, 47 minutes. 
on multiple platforms per day. This is just to understand who are the people who are using this in Malaysia. Next. So the dedicated reference sites to check information for fake news. This is what governments have done. You, WHO has done, UNESCO has done. Since it has been spreading, there are dedicated uh, portals. And uh, next. Purpose is, of course, for you to be able to check against any rumors or any information that you're not clear about. In Malaysia, we have sabanarnia.my. This was set up actually uh, from the previous elections. And it was really to debunk all kinds of misinformation, which is very rife on the social media platform in Malaysia. Next. Internationally, we have quality fact. We have snobs, which journalists use. And you can go and check them out. Next. UNESCO came up with their sites as well and also their own infographics so that journalists could use them in their own countries around the world to help. And UNESCO set up a resource center of responses to COVID-19, helping the media and any, any uh, bloggers and uh, columnists who may want to help you know, debunk rumors, debunk false information, and help spread correct information. Next. So these are just some of the things I just wanted to mention that besides false information, we also had side issues. I'm not going to look at the May 4th to be with you. That was just something to show another satire thing. But there's this, uh, this whole issue about uh, the women's ministry saying, if you go to the next slide, can you please go next? You know, she started saying that how women should behave because there was this issue that domestic violence had uh, spiked internationally, not just in Malaysia during the uh, lockdown because there were more people who were stuck at home and uh, domestic violence had grown. And instead of dealing with the issue, we have politicians who come up and say that uh, maybe the everybody has to be a little bit nicer to each other, but in this case, the onus was put on the woman to look pretty and to to start uh, pleasing her husband so that dress up well so that there will be less violence and uh, disturb chaos in the home. So of course that was became a meme everywhere. Next. Again, that's, you know, things like that happen. Now, the question here is to ask ourselves as uh, academics, as scholars, as students, things that we need to ask even when we're talking about ethical challenges. Why are rumors spreading so rapidly during the pandemic? Do existing methods of control work, like the existing methods, like I told you just now, you come up with the posters with the fake news pulse on the top and you send it out or you have a lot of debunking. What are social media and social media communities? The third question is a new question. The first two questions were already there in, in studies of rumors before, but the third one, because it's the first time there is a pandemic, a major global crisis internationally, and it's the first time that social media communities are involved. So the question that we need to ask in this whole context of how do we manage you know, misinformation in, in a pandemic? Next. So just to go back a little bit historically, why rumors spread, I'll just do it very quickly. The, it spread, there was a study about this in, uh, after, during the World War II, when the US uh, went into World War II after the bombing of the Pearl Harbor and uh, a lot of American public had entered a psychological situation, which is situation, uh, similar to today's uh, situation where you are so unsure of what's happening and you are so fearful of your life and you don't know whether the world is going to end or what's going to happen with the new world. So the anxiety, the uncertainty, the lack of information, the wariness of the information received, all these cause rumors. And uh, psychologists said that we can look at illusory truth effect, which shows that people are more likely to rate something as true if they've heard it before, regardless of its accuracy. So they decided to do this study next. I'm sure that those of you have done uh, Media theories. Heidi, next, please. In 1942, you have psychologists Gordon Alport and Robert Knapp who established the first rumor clinic 
at Harvard University to combat the wartime rumors. And this spread throughout the country in the US where they were actually receiving, they had their weekly uh, sessions, weekly columns to debunk and analyze rumors. At the, eight, at the same time, they would also uh, re debunk anything, the questions that were put forward to them by the public. So it was how they dealt with it and they continued with these clinics until 1943 when the wartime rumors began to dissipate. So this is to just go back a little bit in history to look at how rumors were studied. Next. But in today's, uh, in today's environment, we of course have to think about the social media, which didn't exist then. The, 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 the world is, the, you know, uh, we're talking about a global village, you know. So that didn't exist so much at that time. They didn't really have television. They only had radio and newspapers. So it was not the same effect as today. So today we are just beginning to understand how rumors operate online and in social media networks. And World Health Organization, just as much as many countries, has started partnering with all the big platforms like Facebook, Twitter, Google, to consider ways on how to combat this misinformation. And several of the sites are blocked or they are, you know, whenever there are rumor communities that are being formed by the social media, then again, the, so the, the big ones come in and try to block the social, uh, those, the social media communities, the rumor communities. But there is a need to study more of this type, these types of uh, group dynamics. Okay, next. So basically what we need to look at is truth information based on science and data. And that is what more and more everybody wants. So every day we are looking for the updates by the Director General of Health, by the Majlis Keselamatan Negara on the security issues, and almost weekly by the Prime Minister on related policies. And this is what is happening everywhere in the world. Next. So transparency has become very important. Misinformation is spreading faster than the virus, so it's important for journalists to debunk the lies, report the facts, and promote informed public debate. So all this, this, this free press or this press that is a responsible press is becoming very, very important to counter what's going on in the social media. And in fact, a lot of studies, uh, preliminary studies are beginning to show that a lot of people at this time are going back to listening to the mainstream media, you know, for what's going on on the updates, just to counter check whatever they're receiving on the social media. Next. So difference between fact checking and verification, these are things that you can find in UNESCO. UNESCO has a whole manual to help journalists to verify and uh, do fact checking on fake news so that they don't become perpetrators of fake news themselves. Next. It's joint forces to promote two so major social media campaigns. UNESCO has done it together for fact, science, and solidarity, and don't go viral. And this is really for everyone who is a media leader and an opinion leader out there. They can go to the sites to get more information. So to bolster the effectiveness, they created the COVID-19 Resource Center for the Media and have, uh, as you know, this year's uh, theme for World Press Freedom Day, which was on May 3rd, was journalism without fear or favor, which is very, very apt for the scene, the scene that we are in right now, the environment of this fear and, uh, you know, if this pandemic that we're in now. Next. Just to show some slides, this is our trusted, well-respected director of health. He has become the most uh, trusted person right now, actually, in Malaysia. Every, everyone wants to know from him either from his personal social media or from the mainstream media when he comes out every day to give his updates. He's become a household figure. Next. And civil service, suddenly, you know, we are beginning to respect the civil service a lot more. And it's not just in Malaysia, you'll find it's also in New Zealand and in a few other countries because you're beginning, if we are beginning to, as people, we're beginning to respect the authorities especially the health authorities and the scientific community. Next. 
just to share with you new zealand you know the new zealand prime minister was during this period of time voted as the most effective leader on the planet at least currently she is because of her skills in persuasion in command and the way she has managed the media in new zealand and got everyone to go along with what they are proposing for the to stay at home to to stay safe it's like she has managed to influence with her daily speeches next and so has their director general of health ashley bloomfield just like we have our director general of health has become a household face so has bloomfield in new zealand very much a respected figure in new zealand I'm using new zealand as an example because they stand out in this pandemic in the way they have managed their communication ethically although there will be critics who will say that in a way they muzzled the media because they didn't allow the media to be critical but hey during this pandemic people were not wanting to worry about you know being critical uh in in debunking the politics here involved it's more of what is going to help the community for the people rather than for political debates that are going on between, within the political parties in the nation next id okay i just wanted to mention one point here because we are talking about ethics now i know this is not really of the media but it is also of organizations adelman trust barometer which is done every year this year they also did a special report on covid-19 in march in early march they did it of 10 countries malaysia was not in, involved and neither was indonesia i believe um uh, but from these countries this was some of the key findings they found from the people of the people that they talked with they they interviewed and uh, you can see number 3 the most trusted spokes people the scientists and all the medical uh, experts and again number 2 most relied on source of information uh, went back to the mainstream news organizations because we wanted things from authority and uh, the need for frequency of updates was very important so the rest Uh, I leave it to you to read up on your own. As I've given you the site there, because it's more from a PR perspective and an organizational perspective. But I'm just speaking from a national perspective. This Adelman Trust Barometer at least gives some statistics on how we are reacting to this pandemic as far as information is concerned. Next, the so social media and governance. Just for your information, in case you're not aware. Uh, finally facebook because facebook was is you know one of the most highly used amongst the social media it is still the most highly used it has from two years ago they decided to set up an oversight board for content decisions and they only very recently appointed the chair for this board and they have already appointed 20 out of this 40 experts they have decided to keep them independent and they are going to how they're going to go through the process of monitoring all the facebook posts i think even they do not know yet since they're just starting out but basically it is something where they can track misinformation disinformation and pull it down advise facebook to pull it down at the same time we must understand that different countries already are working with facebook to pull down information that doesn't sit well with their own national agenda and some of it facebook does do according to whatever is according to the law so of course there will be many challenges with this oversight board the national versus the universal the different versions of reposting on other platforms i mean how you going to viral how you going to track to the whatsapp type of platforms Facebook is going to try to do it but let's see it's just in the beginning stages they haven't actually started work all they've done at the moment is to come up with the charter on how this will operate so it is something to look forward to in the future on how misinformation is going to be managed in social media especially on Facebook next 
And we move into our new norms. These are our new norms. We're going to wash, cover, clean, avoid, don't touch, eat cooked food. Next. I just want to go back to, you know, I'm just showing, sharing with you what's our next, our messages now that are coming out strong to us. Now that we have the pandemic, the worst of it is over, at least we think it is over in our country. How are we going to come out and cope with the world, the new world that we are going to be now living in for the next, we don't know how long till we get our vaccine. So of course, there's the Ella country, see the crowded place, the confined space and the close conversation. Keep your distance, wash your hands and don't get, don't be in crowds, wear masks. Okay, next. All this is the new norms, the distance you keep. Next. So finally, I just want to go in through with what can I do? What can I as an individual do? What can you as a student, as a citizen do? So I think I was just sharing some of the things that, you know, I, I feel is something that we can all do. Of course, we can stop, think, check, and verify before we repost. We need to scrutinize information and content we receive we need to verify the source of information with the website every time because sometimes they attribute it to the ministry of health when actually it's not from the ministry of health so you need to go back to the ministry of health and and verify it with a website you need to verify it on dedicated credible portals like sabanania.my or the who the cdc and the rest you need to listen to mainstream news and updates by trusted authorities i mentioned the word trusted because you do have politicians who are telling you things that are not necessarily medically correct. Then you only share if you are certain about the authenticity of the content. Otherwise, don't share. And only share content that is relevant to the receiver. These are things that we as individuals and as users of social media, as netizens, need to be a little bit more concerned about and need to begin to practice. It needs to be our new norm as well. Next. So as uh, the World Health Organization Director General says, we are all in this together and we can only stop it together. This is the time for facts, not fear. This is the time for science, not rumors. This is the time for solidarity, not stigma. This is the way we need to react with all the information that's coming out during the pandemic. And I think the main thing that comes out of this is data and science. We really need to go back into checking our data. And, and if you notice, and I'm sure you're all media students as well, and you realize that data journalism has become such a big thing out there. So it's important to worry about it. In fact, there's one, uh, uh, a very senior journalist in Malaysia who said that our social media accounts, have they become weapons of mass destruction? I mean, he was trying to even ponder on that. And that is something that is worrying and we need to be a little bit more careful about it, more ethical about the information we are putting out so that our social media accounts do not become weapons of mass destruction. Every single one of us needs to be aware of it. Next. So some of the references. Next. I just want to end with lies, kill, facts, say thank you. And I'll take questions. Sorry to eat up into your Q&A time. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Kiranjit. was a great presentation and very resourceful and insightful as well. So uh, everyone here in the audience, maybe uh, every one of you can starting to uh, give uh, questions to uh, Professor Kiranjit. Since we, oh, we still have around maybe 10, 15 minutes, I can give you more times if you want. And uh, happy breakfasting uh, for our brothers and sisters in Malaysia. Uh, Mr. Firdaus and our any other friends, uh, uh, we still wait for another 40 minutes in, in Jakarta. <laughs> All right, uh, Prof. Kiranjit, uh, while waiting for the uh, uh, question from the audience, I would like to ask, um, starting with, with, with one question. So, uh, besides the mainstream media, as you mentioned before, uh, society these days, they sometimes more trust on the uh, informal leaders, like uh, they idol. Let's say in Indonesia, uh, one of the fee of popular here, a popular figure here, talking about the conspiracy theory, the conspiracy theory, as as we know. So, 
nowadays the society is uh, divided into two parts the one who really trust to into the so, uh, conspiration theory and the one is trying to ignore the information so what do you think i mean like uh um what is the the role of informal actors affect the uh, perception of the public maybe you can give uh, your thoughts about what this i i think uh, yeah that's a good question mm. uh, it goes back into our whole uh, understanding you know of uh, this conspiracy theory and celebrities yes being the spokesman for spokespeople yeah. for many of it yeah. now you are correct in many other issues celebrities were used to relay information and yeah. even politicians use yep. them you know that yep. Yeah. Politicians use them to give misinformation and to to influence in in different ways. Mm -hmm. However, when it comes to this pandemic, we haven't really seen too much use of these celebrities. I don't know about Indonesia, but in Malaysia, the celebrities have not really come out strong as strong influencers, social media, social influencers, mm -hmm. social media influencers on pandemic. That's why I said that, you know, one of the things that the pandemic did, you see the change is people are going back to the mainstream news only because we want to get the updates from the Ministry of Health, the Minister, the Deputy, Deputy General of Health, I mean, the Deputy General of Health, we want to get it from the Prime Minister, we want to get it from the, the, the MKN uh, chief. Mm -hmm. These are things we want to do, mm -hmm. as well as even if it's social media, yes, it's being spread a lot and uh, very often you'll be you'll see if you haven't done any study to show it but my own personal experience a lot of the news that has been spread mm -hmm. are actually linked to newspaper stories oh, okay a lot of them to malaysia not just the mainstream media but also like malaysia news portals like malaysia kini free malaysia which us they are i would say they do verify the information they do check the information they do verify the information so they're not blogs, they're news portals. And the people are trained to write in them. Or you have columnists and then you know it's a columnist sharing. And the columnists also when you, a lot of people, they know those columnists or respect the columnists and many of these columnists are former media personalities or they are human rights activists or they are former politicians, but they are respected. Okay. So in a way, they have become the celebrities rather than the entertainment oh. celebrities. Okay, got your point. Thank you, Prof. Kiranji. So we have one question here from Anita Yunia. Yeah. Uh, hello, Prof. Kiranji. Thank you for your sharing. I want to know how University of Technology Mara manage foreign students and communicate them to minimize the information in this pandemic. And in recovery phase, what new normal things of the media that give positive impact for educational sector? Also, very, also good questions. Okay, so when it comes to universities, I will tell you that all the universities that I know of, mm -hmm. the Malaysian universities, became very active on their website as well as their social media. I see. Most of the universities here have social media. Yeah. Like our UITM, we have our Facebook, we have our IG, and we had a lot of the speeches being made by the, the vice chancellor mm -hmm. and was, was shared on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Also speeches and the speech texts by the Minister of Education and other government authorities were also shared on our media. And these speeches, uh, maybe they're in Malay, but we often had translations for English as well. Because when you deal with the foreign students, we sort of look at the language, you know, because sometimes the official speeches tend to be in Malay. But there are translations or they would put in the news because the English news media would carry the English press statements. And uh, so we had the English version. So they were all carried on all our social media as well as on our website. So the foreign students were, you know, had, had easy access to all the information because it was quite right. Also, foreign students who are still on campus, because one of the things we had was there was a lockdown. Students couldn't leave the campus. In the first few days, they were allowed to leave. There was a huge, uh, you know, crowds of people going home to their kampongs. And <laughs> that wasn't the situation. So suddenly there was a lockdown. They were not allowed to leave anymore. They had to stay, they couldn't move. 
because there was this movement control order that was put in place. And uh, every faculty, every because university, UITM is a very large university. We have uh, yeah. 100 and, you know, more than 100,000 students. Yeah. Uh, the population is very large. So they, the faculties took over. Their committee set up at the faculty level and they identified students through, we already had our own channels of communication with them and through their own friends, they could tell. And every, mm -hmm. like the lecturers or the, the course tutors, the different program leaders mm -hmm. were supposed yeah. to connect with them, mm -hmm. tell them what is going on, collect any questions from them, pass them on to a central committee in the university to then liaise with these students. So it was pretty well, I, in my opinion, it was pretty well organized. Mm -hmm. Of course, there will be pockets of you know, lack of communication sometimes or delayed, I would say delayed communication rather than lack, but it was well organized. So it was like they were dealt with, they were dealt with, they were taken care of. The university authorities took care of their own students, treated them like their own family. Yeah. Also, so we, 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 yeah, thank you, Prof. Kiranjit. Also, we also uh, get help from the role of social media. So we, we know as uh, omni media strategy now, when all digital channels is maximized to spread information to, to our students. Also, LSP do the same thing at the moment. And um, maybe I can share uh, uh, my, my slide. So make our into next discussion. Uh, wait a minute. So, so guys, if you you're talking about because the second question was on the recovery phase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one. The impact of the education sector. Generally, in Malaysia, all the universities have gone digital for the next uh, for this whole semester. The universities, no university is going to open up for face to face, except maybe for labs. They haven't. They're still discussing that. Those that need labs, like medical students and engineering students, but there are SOPs in place, standard operating procedures where they must have different they must have enough distance you cannot have too many the rooms cannot be crowded in the labs so for them they will go back they haven't started going back yet because we have our lockdown extended till june the 9th for now so we'll, mm -hmm. we'll see how what happens after june the 9th but generally otherwise whatever can go online has gone online students who are because for us all the final year students for example from s form mm -hmm. the final year students for you know for the whole semester they go on internship. So even companies, because industries have gone online and they're helping students to you know, allow them to graduate. They know these are final semester students, allow them to work from home because the work from home has been uh, intensified. So students are also being allowed to work from home by their employers, wherever they are doing their internship. So those kinds of uh, things are in place. Mm -hmm. And uh, the semester, even the final exams have been converted to final tests. We won't be having this huge uh, final exams anymore in big auditorium halls. So now lecturers have to modify and adjust and have more of term papers and uh, take home tests, you know, rather than a final exam. Because you can't really monitor what students do when they're doing their tests. Give them the limited time, but just change it a little bit. So. The universities have all gone online for the semester. The semester has been extended. Instead of ending in uh, okay. having exams in June, we're not having exams in July. And uh, the next semester also is being delayed. Where schools are concerned, forget about universities, you're talking about schools. Schools, we cannot begin yet because, you know, it's difficult. Not all school children have laptops and not all school children have Wi-Fi in their homes. A family will have four children. They may only have one laptop or one computer. Mm -hmm, How are mm -hmm. four children going to you know, do their school education? So schools haven't reopened yet, but it's a big challenge for the Ministry of Education to figure out on schools. For now, of course, exams like the standard six and the form three exams have been canceled because those are not uh, you know, determinant for your progress in the following to go on to the next okay. uh, level, but like the O levels, A levels equivalent, SPM, STPM, they have all been delayed okay. to take care of this lockdown period. So yes, there are many things in place and basically all universities are cooperating just like all government agencies, all businesses are cooperating 
with the government authorities and the government authorities are having lots of meetings yeah. putting things in place to cope yeah. okay thank you prof uh, and uh, maybe this is the last question for this session uh, okay uh, from medina nur Oh, Nurilahi. Okay, so I I I know this uh, alumni LSPR. Hi, Medina. Um, uh, she asked. I've seen in one of my colleagues' IG story that malls and public space public space in Malaysia has started to open. <laughs> with this new normal happen in Malaysia, how people cope with that? And are the news in Malaysia supporting government about this decision? Thank you in advance, Professor. <laughs> Thanks, Marina, for your question. It's an interesting question because sometimes you're not really don't understand. Yeah. Now, while the malls, because remember, economy had to open. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to be faced with yet another crisis. So economy was opened in stages. So far, social and education are not open yet, but economy has opened. And uh, only limited economy, yeah? like barbers, hairdressers mm -hmm. are not open yet. Massage parlors yes. are not open. So some kinds of gyms are, some are not. Let's say mm -hmm. those that you don't, where you can have distance and you don't have uh, cramped spaces. Now malls have opened. However, there are shops that do not open. We already had restaurants open before. Stalls are not open. Markets have been opened. But whenever there's a case, they lock down again. However, these malls are open. So let me share with you. I went to one of the malls last week on Friday when it was already opened. Not all the shops, maybe about 60 to 70 percent only are open. The big ones are open, like hardware stores, supermarkets, of course, pharmacies, which were, all, which were not closed anyway from the beginning. They are open, food shops. However, for example, you go to a fashion store, you can't try clothes. Mm, okay. So the fitting rooms are all shut. <laughs> so you can go in, but you can't try. And whenever you enter, any shop you enter, you have to have your temperature taken by the bagat. The, the guards are standing in the front and they only allow a certain number in into a space at one point of time because there must be enough to have like one meter space from each other. So while they're open, there are new regulations in place and you need to wear a mask. Some shops won't let you in if you are not wearing a mask. Some will, some won't. Because they can't force you to wear a mask. It's not the law. However, many of them want you to wear the mask. So they do take your temperature, they make you register and they register because they'll allow like only 10 when you leave, they, they calculate who has left. And so only so many number of people can come in at one point of time. So it's not like they're crowded because a lot of people are still afraid to go out. However, before where only one person could go out, only the, the head of the family could go out to do shopping. Now they allow the family from the same household to go, husband and wife and maybe two children or, you know, Four people in a car they do allow now uh, nevertheless they discourage crowds and they definitely will find you and they've been finding a lot of people the fine is 1000 ringgit which is like wow. a standard fine that has been charged to everybody who's caught disobeying the orders yeah. you know where you're not supposed to be so while they're open yes but they're open with SOPs in place Oh, just, right. just like they're doing in Australia and in New Zealand, although those they are more relaxed than we are. Okay, uh, Prof, maybe you uh, can give your closing statement about 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 the issue, so everyone can can get the insights about how how can uh, what is their attitude to to consume the information across our 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 media at the moment. What is the best oh. practice to advice, please, Prof? Okay, that was my slide just now. I ended with you know what I can do, meaning what you and I can do. I think the most important thing is, like I go back to it, we anything we receive, we should just take a moment, stop and think. We need to stop and think, we need to check, we need to verify every information piece of information we get. And we shouldn't simply be happy with our thumbs and our <laughs> fingers spreading, you know, information. Uh, I think a lot of people are also getting fatigue that you don't want to receive any more negative news. Yeah. You're looking for happy stories. Yeah. So there is that fatigue as well. So don't spread that fatigue. We need to be a bit more cautious. We need to practice ethics and social, and we need to be socially responsible. I think the whole, the main thing that will come out of this uh, pandemic is responsibility where, uh, where the social media is concerned. Where mm -hmm. we were treating social media as a tool, mm -hmm. as, a, as a play tool before, I think, mm -hmm. more of a fun tool, 
now I think we are beginning to look at it with uh, more seriousness. Yeah. That it is a serious piece of information. We don't want to tell misinformation. We don't want people to die because of the wrong information we gave them. Yeah. We don't want them to take the wrong medications. We don't want them to take to not take the correct precautions because you know there are because I'm an authority and I tell you you don't need to take like the pandemic. Please go. Of course, you can't watch the pandemic anymore. It has been removed from yeah. from all the sites, but you can read up about it and see how you know it, it was all uh, the conspiracy theory basically of that. Hey, just go about your normal way of life. Don't worry about it. You're not going to die when. <laughs> You know, in front of your eyes, you're seeing television and you know so many people are dying. Okay. Yeah, and unfortunately, you. we have social media influencers who are spreading these conspiracy theories as well. So we need to be wise enough to correct them. I think mm -hmm. one of the things we need to become more active in correcting the wrong, yeah. which we were not doing before. We would ignore. But now if you know something is fake, don't ignore it. Write back and say it is fake. And get hold of that poster that says Palsu. Or get yeah. hold of yeah. that alternative theory, or uh, sorry, not theory, the alternative story or piece of information from a very and post it to show. Oh, yes. You Just need to play it. that role actively. Agreed. Agreed. You need to become participants in the social media for correct information and correcting misinformation. That's what I can say. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, Kiranjit, for having uh, with us to, uh, this this afternoon. Uh, really sorry that the time is very limited. So we hope uh, we will gonna have another uh, session uh, to discuss about this COVID nineteen. And uh, it has never been more important that we come together to fight online misinformation and threat to freedom of expression. I think if we uh, each play our role, guys, uh, together we can overwhelm the COVID nineteen misinformation. And I hope uh, Prof. Kiranjit also agree with uh, with. With uh, what I've said uh, before, so thank you so much. It's a warm greeting from Jakarta, from Indonesia, Professor. Hope to see you again soon and uh, stay healthy and uh, uh, take care as well. Uh, send our regards to our friends in uh, your university. Thank, thank you. you so I've given my email, so if anybody has any questions they would like to ask further on, they can always send me an email. Sure. Thank you so thank much. So I'll go back to uh, Nadine. Thank you so much, Professor. Go back to Nadine, Miss Candy. Thank you so much for being an excellent moderator as well. Oh, sure. Thank you so Thank much, you. Professor. Hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, Thank you very much, Dr. Taufan and also Professor Kiranjit. Um, just one request uh, to all our participants right now. If you could kindly turn on oh, your session. cameras. <laughs> right. for the yes, photo session. Uh, a virtual okay. photo session for all of us. We will just get a screenshot of everyone's faces. Okay. So please turn on your cameras. Please smile. There you go. Okay, everyone's all right. I can see almost everyone. Okay, one, two, three. One more. One, two, three. There you go. Um. Okay. Thank you, guys. Uh, for to our participants today, and also our participants all the way from Malaysia. Um. For. Buka Pawasa is already nearing, so this won't take long. But for those who wanted to stay, please do so. We just have another announcement for our next webinar session, which will be this coming Thursday. And our, you can see the details in your screens right now. It is in partnership with the Montfort University from UK. And our guest speakers will be Dr. Ben Harbisher and Professor Stuart Price to be moderated by Dr. Rudy Sukandar, our very own director of LSPR, Center for Research, Publication, and Community Service. So if you wanted to register to our next webinar session, please feel free to register in tinyurl.com slash webinar airpo. It's the same registration link. Just click the sixth session. So that will be the sixth session of our webinar series. Again, Professor Kiranjit, thank you so much for being with us, as always, for granting our invitation in LSPR. Okay, and then in the next poster, you will see after our session on Thursday, the last session for this month will be on Friday, which talks about foreign students in Indonesia and Europe, challenges while studying abroad during a pandemic. So. 
our target audience for this would be um, students who wanted to study abroad or Indonesians who are studying currently abroad who are stuck abroad during the pandemic so we will have you know a discussion about the survival tips and um basically all the general uh requirements if you wanted to study abroad and what to do if ever you were you will be stuck during a pandemic so there you have it for those who wanted to get an e-certificate for this specific webinar session please do send an email uh, to international office at lsbr.edu together with a screenshot of the this session during and after so it's a proof of your attendance and then we will send you an e-certificate after that all right again um good afternoon to everyone uh hello to our friends um if ever someone else is not here in indonesia or in malaysia good morning or good evening thank you guys for coming